there, internet neighbors, and welcome back to Would Be Productions' interview series highlighting Minnesota filmmaker Peter Hurd and his motion picture, The Control Group. Last week, you learned about casting and hiring talent for a low-budget movie. This week, we asked Peter, how many people work on an independent film? What are the challenges indie directors face shooting on locations? And weapons? How about the safety on that? Let's see what Peter has to say about the challenges faced while producing The Control Group. A physical production on location was 28 shooting days. We shot six day weeks, so it was about four weeks, month of shooting. Um, couple days for pre-production. I think most of the crew and actors were only there two or three days before we started shooting and most people left the day after we finished so relatively in and out um not not as quick as some some movies are a lot of straight to dvd movies shoot in two weeks one week sometimes so compared to some productions we were pretty luxurious compared to a six month hollywood shoot it was pretty tight <laughs> Total throughout the whole process, probably about two to three hundred. Um, and there's probably more that I didn't even know about. But um, production wise, I think it was, uh, yeah, between 50 and 100 people some days because we were, um, we had about 50 crew members that we brought in, but then we used local people for extras and production assistants. And not all of them were there every day. You know, some days we had. A ton of people, some days not as many. And then there were some crew members, like um, weapons people and that, that you just don't need every day, so they're not necessarily there every day of shooting. Usually they were just, just to, you know, watch the shooting and there if we needed them. Um, but some crew members you don't need every day. But then total two to 300 people through the whole process, including post-production. Um, it's interesting, there's a lot of departments where... I guess I didn't really realize this or never really thought about it before I directed for the first time, but it's interesting how many people there are in the crew that you as the director never even see and never even really know they're there. Like during pre-production, you know, you need to get costumes and props and all of this stuff. And there's people who work on it and, uh, you know, work to make the props or, you know, work to find costumes or whatever, but you're not working with them you know, every day. It's just their department head goes out, hires them, gets whatever they need from them, and you never really see them. And same in post-production. There's so many people who work on the sound or the music or whatnot that, again, you never meet because it's kind of its own self-contained process. So it's interesting about how, you know, a third of the people who work on it I've, I've never met. You know, the production designer, art director, they just give me lists of names of people that they hired you know and you put those names in the credits for whatever role the production designer says they did or whoever it is you know so, so it's interesting that there are so many crew members that you you don't even really know about you know you see their work but you never really see them so one challenge for shooting on location is that you do not have control over the time of day like when you're shooting on a sound stage and for us this film was supposed to take place 100 percent at night it's all in one night and obviously we didn't want to become nocturnal for a month so we were filming in the middle of the day so to block out windows unwanted light we were largely just hanging tarps and whatever we could over the windows um the grip and electrical crew took care of that in pre-production i think that was a couple days of just hanging tarps and taping them up and covering up the windows. I think you do actually see that in the background of a few shots. But to me, it it kind of makes sense because if you were running a secret government experiment in there, you'd probably want to keep people out. So you would cover up the windows. So the few times there were, we did kind of debate showing it on camera and we thought, you know, it kind of makes a logical kind of sense to have it in the background. But it was really just for production needs that it was taped up in the first place. Most of um, sound issues were figured out during our initial tech scout, having the sound recordist come up a couple of weeks ahead of time and going through and telling us 
you know, what's not going to work, absolutely. I think there were some locations that were ruled out entirely because the acoustics would just be bad, uh, wouldn't be manageable. So we, we picked locations based on that. So I don't remember that being a particular challenge for production. We hired a uh, set armorer. I think he was out of Chicago. He wasn't a Minnesota local, but he came about through our um, stuntman, Tasso Stavrakis, uh, recommended Matt Stratton, who is our uh, weapons coordinator, uh, supervisor, set armorer. Um, and he brought all of the guns. He had his big trailer of guns that he drove down and Amy handled like the, the explosives, you know, there's scenes where they're setting off grenades and all these other things. And he set up all of those kinds of effects, uh, set up all the weapons, but that is definitely something you want to invest in a professional for, especially for us. We were firing, we were firing blanks on set. We didn't do the gunfire with CGI, which a lot of low budget movies do. It looks a lot better to do it in camera. Um, but even blanks are incredibly dangerous, so that's something you definitely need to hire a professional armorer for. He worked with the actors. He did all the, basically, the safety supervision of the set. There's really a whole process about it that I didn't know that was kind of interesting. Um, you know, you use, for every gun, we had kind of a couple different versions of it. You know, there's only a couple different guns that are used, like a pistol, an assault rifle, a shotgun. You know, you had a couple different, like, military weapons. But we had a couple different versions of each gun, and one was, like, a hard rubber version that doesn't fire at all. And that's normally what you use for scenes where the guns don't have to go off. Like unless it absolutely has to be loaded with a blank for safety reasons, you just don't do it because so much can go wrong. Um, so, you know, you just use the, the hard rubber versions for scenes, you know, when the crow people are just carrying guns around and they don't go off in the scene or anything like that, or the characters are, if they have to, you know, I don't remember any particular shots, but if they had to, like, move a gun or jostle it a lot, you know, you don't want to use something that could accidentally go off. So you just use these hard rubber versions. And then when they're actually firing, that's the same as a real gun you would buy out of a gun store. It's not modified or anything. It's just the... Uh, yeah, it's the, the real thing. Um, and you're just loading it up with blanks. That's what I, I, I thought, too, when we were first talking to the armor. I'm like, so is there something different about the guns themselves? I didn't really know how it worked. I'm like, do you modify them? He's like, nope, real guns, just the blanks that are in there. So another reason to be very careful. And it's really, it's a whole process. You know, once you've decided on the scene, you rehearse it and block it with the the fake guns, the hard rubber that aren't going to fire you get everybody in location, get your shot set up, and the actors stay where they are while the set, the weapon supervisor, loads the gun, brings it to them, so they don't have to pick it up or carry it across the room or anything. Like, It's always designed to have the least amount of time of the actors holding the guns. You film it. Um, we had a lot of like plexiglass barriers for the explosions and gunfire so that you know, shrapnel and dust and stuff wouldn't hurt the camera. There's a lot of shots where there's literally just a pane of plexiglass right in front of the camera, but you don't see it, obviously. Um, and then when the scene is done, as soon as you call, t uh, as soon as you call cut, uh, the actors stay where stay where they are. And the and this I thought was kind of weird, but the armor comes up behind them and taps them on the shoulder, and then they have to. There's like a very particular way they hand the gun off, like they hand it back to the um to the supervisor and that's so you're not standing in front of them if the gun accidentally goes off and then you have to pat them on the shoulder because the actors are usually wearing you know some kind of hearing protection so they can't necessarily hear you talking to them um for scenes like there's a scene when grant has the shotgun in the little tunnel and he shoots the two crow people he shoots one in front of him shoots one behind him definitely loud we <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little surprised no one got hurt or lost their hearing on that. For that, again, it was maximum safety. So if crew members didn't need to be there, we cleared them out. Even like the sound crew, you know, we didn't film. That scene was shot silently because we're obviously just going to put in a gun sound effect. There's no point blowing out our microphone trying to record this blank sound when our, you know, one cut in is going to be better. Um, so even like the sound crew waited outside cause this was like a tiny little tunnel in a sub basement. So all of the noise from that shotgun, 
it's like almost as loud as a real shotgun and all of that noise is being concentrated into this tiny tunnel and basically being launched at where the crew is sitting so when we did that like we fired the shotgun and people came running down like thinking there had been an explosion or something they thought someone was dead I have no idea how people do those <laughs> kinds of movies. I've heard some crazy stories from low-budget filmmakers uh, working in L.A. Uh, you know, I've heard stories about where they get... I won't name any names, but I've heard of name actors. Well, not big names. DVD name actors that are... they uh, Producers will like pick them up from the airport, and they'll say, Hey, we'll give you a ride home if we can stop on the way there, and we'll pay you, like you know, $1,000, $5,000, whatever it is, and a ride home from the airport, you know, from doing some bigger movies. Like, you just need to stop at this, you know, green screen studio, say a couple lines, you know, they just read the lines off cue cards, you know, shoot it in front of a green screen so they can put them wherever, wherever they need them, and that's it, you know. Um, so there's, there's some pretty inventive solutions. Uh, if you watch a lot of straight to Netflix or straight to Redbox movies, you'll see it's not very conducive to great filmmaking, but it gets the job done, I guess. No, it's brutal. The schedules are like sci-fi channel originals. Those are like 10 to 15 days. Some of those movies. Sharknado. I mean, look at those movies. <laughs> you know, they didn't spend too much time, but the, the whole philosophy on that is do production as cheap as possible, which basically means doing it as fast as possible and doing the post-production as cheap as possible. So that's pretty much their only concern. Thanks for tuning in. Come back next week to learn more about the complex and wonderful world of post-production.